Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. As always, on the fourth Wednesday of the month, I'm joined by Mark Labar, conservation biologist for Audubon, Vermont. And today we get an update on how Vermont's endangered and threatened birds did this summer. Nice to see you. Always great to be here, Judy. So before we get to our endangered bird update, I want to read a letter that was sent to us okay. by Pat Alvarez from Richmond. And he wrote, I've been, he or she, I've been feeding birds, squirrels, etc., for years. I buy my seed from guys in Williston this morning while there. I spoke to the lady at the desk about the lack of birds and squirrels I've been noticing for the last month. She told me that not only had she been experiencing this, but she heard that many customers say the same thing. What's going on? Yeah, this is uh, one of those things our phones have been kind of ringing, well, ringing off the hook is a little bit maybe overkill, <laughs> but there have been a lot of calls coming in mm -hmm. and a lot of questions, uh, even on soccer sidelines watching my daughter play, people will come up to me. Um, and basically what it comes down to is it's been warm, you know, we've had this kind of extended warm weather. Uh, there's lots of food out there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of insects, lots of berries, good acorn crop, good seed cone crop. Um, and with the warmer weather, you know, energetics wise, birds don't require that much food. So uh, they really don't have to go to feeders. Um, I can't really speak to the chipmunks and squirrels, uh, but uh, you know, birds, there's plenty of stuff out there that they can still feed on and take advantage of. As I wander the woods, I see a lot of birds moving through, the, you know, the migrants, white-throated sparrows, uh, yellow uh, myrtle warblers, you know, they all have food to feed on. And I think once we get the, you know, that really cold weather that comes in and starts to say, stay, I think we're going to start seeing um, more birds back. So that's, that's hopefully the case. I, 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 you know, in checking with everybody else in the bird world, that seems to be the consensus. Excellent. All right. So now that we've got that answer, let's talk about Vermont's endangered and threatened birds. Yeah. So um, Audubon, Vermont, part of the work that we do, um, we work with uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife uh, to monitor a number of endangered species. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just thought I'd give folks an update on how some of these species are doing. And when I say endangered and threatened, those are the two categories. We also have another group called what we call the recently recovered. These mm -hmm. are species that used to be endangered or threatened and have been successfully taken off the list. So we'll touch on those too because they're uh, familiar birds to that people, you know, have, we've talked about before on the show. So where do you want to start? Let's start with my favorites, uh, common tern. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a state endangered bird. This is a bird that I've been working with now for the past uh, I hate a to say time. it to you, 30 years. Yeah. This is my 30th year out on the lake keeping an eye on these guys. Uh, they're a small uh, lake bird, feed on fish. Uh, they nest on small islands. Uh, the islands are owned by uh, the Green Mountain Audubon Society. Audubon Vermont manages them. This is Papa Squash Island, the, the probably the largest colony and the oldest colony, and the terns nest all over the top of that. Um, they lay their eggs right on the ground. Um, sometimes they don't even use, you'd see a lot of sticks here, sometimes they don't even use that. Sometimes they just nest on bare rock. And, um, and then they nest colonially. So here's a common tern. Uh, personally, a beautiful bird, I, I think. That black cap and red bill. You can see that blue tag there in the front. That's mm -hmm. how we monitor the nests. Okay. And they nest colonially, so you know, up on Papa Squash Island, we may have a couple hundred of birds all nesting at the same time. So, um, after a while, uh, the terns hatch. This is a pair of fledglings, so this is a pair of birds that can fly, but mm -hmm. they still stick around with their parents. Tough to see in this shot, but they do have metal bands on them. Okay. So we keep track of them. And uh, the terns did pretty well this year. Uh, we had about 225, 220 pairs, which is what we've had the past couple years. Uh, we got about 70 plus chicks off that managed to fledge. Um, we did have some predation and some abandonment because of the weather, but all in all, it was a 
pretty stable year for the tern. So that's good. All that right. was yeah, that was a good thing to see. Now this next species is not technically endangered, right? Right. So this is one of those recovered species, okay. uh, and this is the peregrine falcon. Uh, Audubon, Vermont. My coworker Margaret Fowl, who's been on the show before, yes. is um, she's the one that manages uh, this project um, and works with a lot of citizen science volunteers, which we thank that keep an eye on the cliffs. Uh, peregrines, as most of us, some of us know, like to nest on cliffs. Uh, they're an extremely fast bird, lost uh, their nests. They went kind of, ex they were extirpated from Vermont because of DDT. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were hacked back in, and now they seem to be on um, all over the place. Uh, natural cliffs, quarry cliffs, and a pair were even seen on uh, bridges now. So, well, that's um, good news. and even down at the old nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. They nested on one of the towers there. Oh, no kidding. So they've done really well. Uh, they had 51 pairs this year, um, 44 of those nested, and they got off 63 young. Wow, yeah, that's a we, lot. Yeah, which is about what <laughs> we've done in the past. Yeah, this is what <laughs> they look like. Um, you know, originally their recovery goal was 30 pairs. So, um, you know, when they were on the endangered species list, that was the goal that was set through the recovery plan. Many of these species have recovery plans that are developed by uh, the scientific advisory group on birds, um, which I'm on and Margaret's on, and then the endangered species committee, and it goes up to the um, higher up the chain. Mm -hmm. Um, and that process reverses itself, and the peregrine is one of those that was um, removed, but we still keep an eye on it and monitor it. Okay, what's next? So uh, another one of those birds on the recovery list, and this is what's great with working with the um, the scientific advisory group on birds is we have had some successes with these endangered birds. The common loon, uh, which is a bird that, you know, when I first started doing work here 20, 30 years ago, you know, there were maybe 10 pairs out there uh, and being monitored. Uh, this year we had 97 pairs of loons in the state. Uh, and they're getting to the point where they're actually, um, we're, we don't have as much space for them. Uh, they nest um, right on the water. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about loons, their legs are very far back on their bodies so they can't walk on land or it's very difficult for right. them. So they need to have this access right next to the water so they can slide in and out. Um, again, they're monitored by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Uh, the loon program um, put buoys out, keeps folks from bothering them. Um, but they've become very used to humans. Um, this is what a loon chick looks like when it's first hatched. Uh, they usually have two eggs, and those chicks will ride on the back of the adults. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, another successful recovery. In fact, there's an annual loon watch that's done every spring, and they had more than 300 loons that were seen across the no state. No kidding, that's great. So uh, this is a bird, and obviously it was on our both the peregrine falcon, and I think the loon were on our license plate. Right. Uh, there for a while. So, um, again, it's nice to, these are two birds that not only recovered, uh, but continue to do really well. And again, the, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, who oversees these programs and works with Audubon and the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, um, you know, puts the time and energy to make sure these species continue to stay off the list. And it's something that people care about, too, because, you know, a lot of times it restricts where you can hike, it restricts where you can boat. Right. And, and people respect that. They do. They do. In fact, a lot of the loon volunteers, you know, both the peregrines and loons have these volunteers mm -hmm. that monitor them, are very very protective of their loon pairs on their lakes and these are just folks that have camps and keep an eye on things and work with Eric Hansen who is the, the loon biologist for VCE so it's a really great success story and combined effort with scientists and citizen scientists in the state and all that stuff. Alright let's talk about bald eagles. I saw my first bald eagle in Vermont last spring. Or last yes fall. and so bald eagles right this is a bird that uh, is is on the endangered species list um, and is a bird that used to be pretty rare in the state. Vermont was one of the last states to get pairs of nesting eagles. In fact, our first nest was in 2002. Mm -hmm. And um, we had our first fledgling. It took 
six years before the first fledgling came off. Uh, they make these big nests, which are pretty obvious. Uh, you can't really miss them. You can't really miss them, uh, although ironically, some people do. So well, we, the foliage isn't out the, here. Yeah, so. well, right. This one's in a, in a, th a nest uh, is up in a tree that doesn't have leaves. But sometimes they'll see birds, and it may take a while to find where the nest is. But they're usually quickly seen and, mo and monitored. The state keeps an eye on this population. and. Um, they had a recovery plan put in place. Uh, they need to have, um, I think, 19 eagles in Vermont, pairs in Vermont, to look at downlisting and delisting, and 30 pairs for uh, some nesting that includes in the Connecticut, in the River Valley, mm -hmm. and, and New Hampshire and New York State as well. Uh, and this year, we're at 21 pairs uh, here in the state, um, with 31 chicks that. Uh, managed to fledge. Wow. So this is a bird that now is pretty common. We have growing numbers during our winter surveys and people see these birds all the time. Um, and it's again another great recovery story and these birds will be hopefully coming back um, probably delisted, downlisted within the next three, four years. Just an awesome sight. Yeah. All right, another big bird with a big nest. Yeah, so ospreys. Mm. They were the first ones to remove. Again, a recovering species. This is one of those birds that's gotten to the point where it's even tough to keep track of where and how many nests there are. So the state kind of monitors new nests, and there's still projects going to put platforms up for these birds' nests. Many people see them going out to the islands at Sandbar. So this is another success story. Again, like you said, big nest oftentimes on these platforms, but still oftentimes on, um, you know, regular structures too. So another success, tough to get numbers on them because there's so many of them. What are some of the lesser known species? So, uh, you know, it's funny because we do talk about these big species. Even some people don't know, you know, common terns, you know, I'm an advocate, but, you know, they're not as known as peregrines and loons and eagles and osprey. But we do have a population of black terns uh, in the state. Uh, this is a a tern, just like the common tern, gets its name because of its coloration. But instead of nesting an island, it nests in marshes. Oh, okay. And so the population in Vermont is com found completely up the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. And they nest on this. This is actually a mat of vegetation that floats up. And it's kind of a floating mat out in the middle of the marsh. And uh, they had an awesome year this year, 163 pairs, 66 nesting pairs, wow. which is up from previous years of around 100, 125. So even though we have those, the population has kind of shrunk and is only now at Missisquoi, uh, it is a population that has stabilized and continues to grow. So Excellent. that's actually a threatened bird in Vermont. Okay. Or no, I'm sorry, it is endangered. The next bird is threatened. Okay. Which and is? this is an even lesser known mm -hmm. bird. Uh, the grasshopper sparrow. Now, um, this people see song sparrows and white-throated sparrows, white-crowned sparrows, and those guys can be tough. Little brown jobs, little brown birds. They all look alike. They all look alike, <laughs> right? Uh, the grasshopper sparrow is a bird. It's a grassland bird. It uh, nests on the ground, nests in grassy areas. Uh, and in Vermont, our population is maybe only 25 birds, pairs that we have. And many of them are nesting on state airports. So the habitat that's managed for those airports actually benefits these birds. Uh, they do nest outside of those areas, and we find them popping up here and there down at Dead Creek and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, they get their name because they have a very insect-like song, which sounds kind of like a grasshopper, I guess. Okay. Well, good stories. Good yeah, so stories. really, um, the birds in Vermont um, have been doing really well. There's some that haven't been. Upland Sandpiper, Sedge Wren, Henslow Sparrow, which hasn't been seen in years and years, but uh, these are these are pretty much the success stories here. We've got a couple of minutes left. Let's get to uh, some more viewer mail. Um, here's a picture from Mike LaFontaine from Champlain, New York, and he writes, can you help me identify this bird? It's about the size of a robin. The picture was taken on the Great Chazy River in Champlain, New York. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a, it's a great shot, and yeah. uh, you can see that white eye ring around that uh, bird's eye and uh, the flecking on the back. This is a solitary sandpiper. 
which we find here in Vermont, uh, and it gets its name because you often see it by itself. Um, so this is a great little sandpiper that you would find. Um, this was, I think, in the fall, this time of year, September or so, when he sent this in. And so it would be a bird late August that you would start to see migrating and, of course, using Champlain, Lake Champlain. But you'd find it back in beaver ponds mm -hmm. as well. Um, in the state. And we have another question from Phyllis Ricker who writes, I took this picture, I'm not sure what kind of duck this might be. I took the picture on Lake Fairley and it was the only one there. Yeah, so this is, uh, if you were to see this bird, the male bird, uh, it might clue it in. Uh, this is a female wood duck. Uh, and the male bird is quite gaudy, a <laughs> uh, little, little over the top, yep. Uh, the female, as with a lot of waterfowl, are much, uh, you know, the plumage is much less gaudy, so they can sit on those eggs and protect them. All right. Well, if you have a bird-related question, you can contact Mark. You can write to him at Audubon, Vermont, 255 Sherman Hollow Road in Huntington. The zip code is 05462. You can also email Mark your questions. That address is mlabar at audubon.org. Send Mark your question and or picture, and he'll try to find answers for you on an upcoming edition of Bird Notes. Thanks so much. Always great to be here. It's yeah. good time. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.